For more on the impact of falling oil prices, we're joined by Kent Moores from Florida. He's the executive chair at the Money Map Global Energy Symposium. Kent, good to have you on the show. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Michelle. Kent, oil prices hammered today, plunging 6%. Now, there is a huge rise in U.S. crude stockpiles. U.S. crude oil inventories surged three times more than expected. They're now at the highest level for this time of year in at least 80 years. So, Kent, why are U.S. oil producers not cutting back if there is this oversupply? Well, there are a couple of factors, Michelle. One is... With oil already in the production pipeline, it is simply more efficient for an operator to move it on to market, even though they're moving it on at lower price. But the second thing to keep in mind is that we're likely to see a peaking of oil production in the United States relatively briefly, but a peaking nonetheless between July and September. The reason for that is the unconventional uh, shale and tight oil that is essentially fueling this tremendous rise in production are coming from wells that have most of their production coming online within the first 18 months. We're going to see a retiring of that period by uh, later uh, this summer, and that peak coming down is going to be rather uh, steep. Normally, you use uh, enhanced recovery techniques or secondary recovery techniques to stem that fall. But in the current pricing climate, that's simply not going to be the case. And so as a result, we've got plenty of reserves out there. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have a shortage in oil. But that pricing floor is going to be rising, and the operators know it. All right. Well, that explains what's happening here in the U.S. But uh, we've got the OPEC producers. They're suffering a lot. Venezuela, Nigeria, Iraq, and Ecuador they're really hurting oil being their major export, yet Saudi Arabia is producing more and more oil. What's the thinking here? Well, I think the Saudi strategy is rather interesting. They have, uh, they reached 10.3 million barrels a day last month, and the oil minister a couple of days ago, Al Nami, indicated they're likely to stay about that range into the foreseeable future. This is now a contest for market share within OPEC. It began mm -hmm. as a contest for market share with Russia on the one hand and U.S. shale producers on the other. That situation is now being solidified in, in Saudi thinking by maintaining the Saudi position inside OPEC. So we're already beginning to see rifts. There's a considerable amount of production coming online beyond the monthly quotas of several of the OPEC members. And here we're talking about Nigeria, uh, to a lesser right. extent, Iran, but certainly Venezuela. Venezuela needs a price of oil at about $150 a barrel to have any hope whatsoever of balancing their current budget. In other words, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, Kent, and Venezuela is really hurting. How far is the country from economic collapse at the moment, and, and what can Venezuela actually do about this? Very little, Michelle. Uh, I've already said in print that Venezuela is rapidly becoming a failed state waiting to happen. It's a situation in which the economy has been, so has been uh, maintained and artificially enhanced by a considerable amount of government largesse, which simply isn't there any longer with the current price of, of crude oil. It's so bad that PDVSA, the national oil company, has been required to purchase with some of its profits and import foodstuffs into Venezuela. And as one of my colleagues down there said recently, we thought we were an oil company, not a supermarket. That's how bad things are getting there. All right, Kent, Venezuela's really hurting. As you mentioned, so is Nigeria, so is Russia, and the Saudis want to maintain their market share. This is leading to speculation that Venezuela, Russia, Nigeria, maybe some of the other OPEC countries may decide to form their own oil cartel. How likely is that? I think it's, it's very unlikely. Now, Russia, remember, Michelle, is not part of OPEC. It is it is, along with the United States, the largest producers that aren't members of OPEC. They've been hit it on the chin, however, because their budget requires a, a crude oil price of 80 to 85 dollars a barrel. And so as a result, the cutback in prices and the collapse in the ruble 
uh, has, has hit Russia considerably. I think another OPEC or another cartel is exceptionally unlikely. From time to time, you see the, uh, the Gulf Coordination Council uh, countries arguing they may want to have a GCC equivalent of OPEC, but that's not really gone very far. What it is that countries outside like Russia don't want is a cartel telling them how much they have to produce each month. All right, Kent, one of the big news of today, Royal Dutch Shell taking over BG Group in that $70 billion deal. Do you see more consolidation happening? Yes, and in fact, the, the merger and acquisition curve has been increasing for some time. The interesting thing is we are on the verge of having more M&A deals, but for smaller projects. We started this whole curve with uh, Halliburton taking over Baker Hughes, and then we had Schlumberger and Eurasia in Russia entering into an agreement. We started with the big uh, plays, but the plays are actually becoming smaller for the simple reason that companies in the United States are having exceptional difficulty in maintaining their debt servicing. And that's going to be the major source of M&A. So this huge deal coming out of the woodwork was rather unanticipated. Let me simply mention two things here. Number one, the devil is always in the details with, with projects as big as this one. And number two, BG is not well liked in the UK. So you can expect there to be a rare uh, cross aisle agreement in the House of Commons to look at this one with a fine tooth comb. All right. We're going to have to leave it there as always. Thank you, Kent Moore's executive chair at the Money Map Global Energy. Some